Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Darien Library. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Erin Shea, and I'm the head of adult programming here at the library. I just want to briefly mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make our collection and programs like these available to the community. Tonight is very special. I like to think that all our programs are special, but tonight isn't particularly special for a number of reasons. Uh, one of those is this past summer, my friend and colleague Stephanie and I were talking and we were like, how can we better support debut authors at Darien Library? Uh, something they like to say in the publishing business is that everything Oprah touches turns to gold. And we like to think that in Darien, we could also turn things to gold by touching it. <laughs> and <laughs> we also have, for tonight's guest, we, uh, it, our job was very easy because when something is already gold, it's actually very easy to promote it to your community and make people want to read a certain book. So Laura Lamont's Life in Pictures, which is what you'll see behind me right here, we believe is that title. And we said, what can we do to better promote this? We created a series that is called First Look Darien, and you're at the very first event in that series. About three times a year, maybe more as it grows in popularity, we are going to handpick an up and coming uh, first time novelist and showcase them at the library and sort of just basically force all of you to read them. <laughs> and this is the very first event in that series. Tonight's guest is visiting us from New York City. Her fiction and nonfiction have been published in Tin House, The Paris Review, Time, Slate, and The New York Times. And she is a staff writer for Rookie, which is something I just discovered. And even though it's for teenage girls, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> she lives with her husband in Brooklyn. And he's here tonight as well. And if you're having one of those delicious brownies, she actually is the one who baked and brought those brownies as well. So, yeah. <laughs> Forget the book. We're all just fans of the brownies. <laughs> She is also a bookseller in Brooklyn. So please, if you'll join me in welcoming to Darien Library, Miss Emma Straub. I, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, I have to say I learned a long time ago that baked goods really help. You know? <laughs> Um, I, I was just telling um, someone here that I was just, I was born just a few miles away in the Norwalk Hospital. Um, and I, I lived uh, with my family in Westport until I was three. And then they, you know, they, they stole me away and forced me to move to New York City. But um, I really do feel like I'm coming home um, in a very literal way tonight and I'm so grateful to be here and especially grateful to Aaron and Stephanie for choosing me for this First Look Darian, which I'm very excited about. Um, okay, so I'm going to read two sections tonight from Laura Lamont's Life in Pictures. Um, the first section is uh, the, the very beginning of the book, so you don't have to know anything at all, so I'll just get rolling. Uh, summer 1929. Elsa was the youngest Emerson by 10 years, the blondest, happiest accident. It was John, Elsa's father, who was the most pleased by her company. His older daughters already wanted less to do with the Cherry County Playhouse, and it was nice to have Elsa skulking around backstage, her white blonde hair and tiny pink face always peeking out from behind the curtain. Elsa was a fixture, the theater's mascot, and the summer crowds loved her. The Cherry County Playhouse, so named because of the cherries Door County produced, was housed in a converted barn on the Emerson property in Door County, Wisconsin's Thumb. The barn was 200 feet off the road, which had been renamed Cherry County Playhouse Road in honor of Elsa's parents' efforts and because there was no real reason not to. From May until September, tourists from Chicago and Milwaukee, and sometimes even further afield, drove up and stayed in the small wooden rental cabins for the entire summer. After days spent on Lake Michigan or Green Bay, they would pile into the old barn and sit on wooden pews cushioned with calico pillow pillows sewn by Mary, Elsa's mother. John directed and often starred, his booming baritone carrying into the surrounding trees all the way to the road. 
the older girls, Hildy and Josephine, who had been such promising Ophelias and Juliets in their early teens, had instead taken jobs at the, t at the tasty custard shack down the road and could most often be found handing over cones of frozen custard. Elsa was nine years old and happy to participate. She tore tickets, swept the stage of errant clods of dirt, and doted on the barn cat who hated everyone, especially children. The actors and crew members all moved on to the Emerson's land for the entire summer. The boys from fancy schools on the East Coast, the ones with drama programs and crew teams, and all the delicate young women moved into the main house. The men with sturdier constitutions slept in tents and cabins scattered around the property, which gave the whole place the feeling of a summer camp. Elsa loved cuddling up to the beautiful young women who would do her makeup and brush her hair for hours on end, all for the low cost of listening to them talk about their sordid and endlessly complicated relationships with men back home. Hildy, Elsa's second oldest sister, was 19 and had few interests outside of her own body. She would sometimes borrow her mother's sewing machine to make new dresses, but would give up halfway through and leave the fabric limping off to one side like a wounded animal. Hildy was given to, to the dramatic, despite having forsaken the theater. Mother, I could not possibly help you with the dishes. My headache is the size of Lake Michigan, Hildy said. It had previously been the size of the kitchen, the size of the house, and would soon be the size of the entire state of Wisconsin. Elsa sat underneath the long barn wood table and watched Hildy waggle her knees back and forth. Excuse me, Mary said. There is no room for talk like that in this house. Elsa could hear Mary's tired hands shift to her hips where they would roam around, pressing into the sore spots with her wide, blunt thumbs. Mary woke at dawn and made breakfast for the entire cast and crew. That summer, it was 27 people, all of whom would groan loudly if given the chance. The girl's mother ran a tight ship. Elsa often thought that her mother would have made an excellent homesteader, as she seemed happiest when conditions were tough and the going was hard. Hildy rubbed her temples. She always had headaches. All the Emerson women did, blackout, knockdown headaches that crowded the sides of their skulls and didn't let go for days. One of Elsa's chores was dampening a washcloth and placing it over her mother's and sister's closed eyes, then tiptoeing out of the room. Elsa couldn't wait to be a woman, to feel things so deeply that she too needed a dark room and total silence. She'd asked her sister about the headaches once when she could expect them to start and had been laughed out of the room. Honestly, mother, Hildy said. She was the most beautiful of the three Emerson sisters, though Elsa was so young that she hardly counted. Josephine was the oldest and the most like their mother, with a wide, flat face that hardly registered any expression whatsoever. It was what their father called a Norwegian face, which meant it had the look of a woman who had seen 15 degrees below zero and still gone out to milk the cows. <laughs> Josephine was inevitably going to marry one of the boys from the cherry farms down the road, and no one thought they would be anything more or less than perfectly fine. But Hildy was better than fine. Elsa loved to look at her sister, even when Hildy was having one of her episodes and her blonde hair was wild and matted against one side of her head from all her flip-flopping and thrashing in her sleep, and her pale pink skin had flushed and broken out into a crimson red. When she wanted to, Hildy could look like a movie star. It hadn't come from their mother, that was a fact. Neither the raw good looks nor the knowledge of what to do with them. Hildy pored over all the magazines she could find, Nash's and Photoplay and Ladies' Companion, and practiced putting on the actress's eyeliner in the mirror for hours every day until she got it right. When Hildy was feeling light, as she put it, and the headaches were gone, she wriggled through the house in cast-off costumes, and Elsa thought she was as beautiful and lost as a landlocked mermaid. OK, now I'm going to skip. Um, so, a lot happens. <laughs> a lot happens very quickly. Um, so, uh, there's a family tragedy, which I, do I need to tell you what it is? No, no. okay. So, uh, something happens shortly after that seg section, um, and then the, the chapter, the first chapter sort of fast forwards uh, about 10 years until Elsa is, um, 
just about 18 years old, and she marries a, a young actor who is, you know, who is one of the actors at the theater, and they take off um, on a bus for Los Angeles. Uh, it's 1938, and she and this man, Gordon Pitts, you can tell I don't like him because his last name is Pitts. Um, they get married and they have two children immediately, Clara and Florence, um, and. Uh, Gordon gets some, has some luck getting acting jobs, but, but Elsa really doesn't uh, because she's home taking care of these two small girls. Um, and then they go to a party, a rap party, at the Gardner Brothers studio, um, and Elsa meets a producer there named Irving Green who sees something in her and he dubs her Laura Lamont at the party. Um, and so this is... Just a, just a little bit after that. Irving Green had an idea every 35 seconds. Laura like, okay, so now she's calling herself Laura Lamont. Laura liked to time him. Sometimes they were about her career, but sometimes they were just about the studio. He wanted to bring in elephants for a party and offer rides. He wanted to hire a French chef for the commissary to make crepes. Had she ever had a crepe? Irving told Laura that he'd take her to Paris for her 25th birthday. They hadn't slept together yet. Laura hadn't lied. But she would also be lying if she said she didn't see it coming, cresting somewhere on the horizon. She'd heard things about his previous flirtations, including Dolores D. There were so many pretty girls around. How could she expect to have been his first temptation? And Laura wasn't interested in being anyone's fling. Before anything happened, before Paris, before sex, she would be a star, a real one, and there would be a firm understanding of exactly what was going on. Elsa hadn't become Laura to become someone's wife, and Irving had promised, though not in those exact words. What he'd actually said to her had more to do with what he wanted to do with Laura once she was his wife, and they were living in the same house. It made Laura blush even to think about it. Irving had a part in mind, a movie about a nurse and a soldier, nothing like the last movie. Ginger was a comedian, that's what the studio had decided. Let her stick with the funny stuff, the Susie and Johnny business. She did pratfalls and made goofy faces. Laura was something else. She was a real actress, Irving was sure. The movie was a drama about love torn asunder by war. No dance numbers, no parasols. He told Laura that she would have to dye her hair a good dark brown, the color of melting chocolate. As if she had a choice, Laura said yes and started that night painting her eyebrows using a darker pencil. He wanted to watch the hair girls do it. The hairdressers were used to Irving sitting in on important fittings with Cosmo and Edna, the costume designers, but it was unusual for a simple dye job and made Laura even more nervous. Florence was so young. What if she didn't recognize her? What if Clara hated it? When Laura told Ginger what they were planning to do, Ginger screwed up her face and shook her head. Nope, she said, you're a blonde, inside and out. This is just weird. But Laura didn't have a choice and didn't struggle when Irving led her to the chair by her elbow. Dark, he said to the girls, who were already mixing a bowl full of nearly black goo. Serious. Laura had never been anything but a blonde. Dark-haired people stood out in Door County like people who were missing a hand. <laughs> Almost all of the natives were blonde and fair Norwegian or Swedish blood pumping strongly through their American veins. If she went back now, her mother and father would pause at the door, their hands still on the knob, unsure of whether or not to let her in. She locked eyes with Irving in the mirror. Bright, naked bulbs ringed his face like a halo, which seemed funny. Irving wasn't an angel. He was a businessman, the first she'd ever really known. Even though Irving was physically small and slight, with his famously bad heart ticking slowly inside him, Laura never thought of him that way. He had the confidence of a lumberjack or a lion tamer or a black bear. Laura trusted him implicitly. If he wanted to dye her hair himself, she would have let him. This is going to be good for you, Irving said. You have to do it, Laura. I know it. Trust me. This is going to be what sets you apart. He looked to the girls and nodded. Do it. Laura shut her eyes tight and waited for them to start. The dye was thick and cold against her scalp, the way she imagined wet cement might feel. It didn't take long, maybe an hour. 
One of the girls, a tiny blonde with rubber gloves up to her elbows, told Laura to open her eyes. First, she held out her hand, and Irving took it, giving her fingers a quick squeeze. Look at yourself, he said. Laura Lamont, open your eyes. His voice was gentle. Irving liked what he saw. Laura blinked a few times and focused on the stained towel in her lap, her free hand clutching at her dress. She looked up slowly, and by the time she made it to her own face in the mirror, she knew that Irving had been right. Her skin had always been pink. Now it was alabaster. Her eyes had always been pale. Now they were the first things she saw, giant and blue. Wow, she said, turning her head from side to side. Look at me. She covered her mouth with her hands, embarrassed at her own reaction. Irving was already looking. He bent his knees to crouch beside her chair. Look at you, Irving repeated. He kissed her on the forehead and then on the mouth, and the girls pretended to be occupied in the back of the room. Irving's lips were stronger than Laura anticipated and pressed against her with the force of a man who had, been, who had kissed many, many women before and had no doubt in his own abilities. She closed her eyes and made him be the one to pull away. Once Irving straightened up and ran a, ha a hand over his own hair, the hairdresser still tittering and chatting and washing things in the back room sink, he helped Laura to her feet. Laura pull pulled the hairdresser's cape off her shoulders and set it down on the chair. She couldn't take her eyes off herself in the mirror. So, she said, shifting her gaze from her own reflection to Irving's. Tell me about this part. I'll stop there. Now, I'm um, more than happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Personal, baking, writing, <laughs> yes. Yes, Erin. I've been dying to know a little bit more about your research process. I know that you thanked a particular library in your acknowledgments, yes. which I always love. Yeah. But you had so much rich detail about a fictionalized, but not completely fictionalized old Hollywood. Yeah. So I'd love to know how you Thank you. That's, that, that is a perfect setup um, for what I wanted to make sure that I got a chance to say today and here. Um, you know, I love bookstores. I work at a bookstore. I think bookstores are vitally important. But I could not have written this book without the library. Um, I, I did, I started, uh, you know, just at my local branch of the Brooklyn Public Library. But then when I, when I really knew how much I had to do and how much I had to learn because the book, you know, it starts in 1929, but it doesn't end until 1980. Um, and so there was a, a whole lot um, that I had to find out. I grabbed my husband and um, forced him to go to Los Angeles with me several times. He didn't really mind. Um, but I spent a lot of time at the special collections library in, in Los Angeles that's owned and operated by the Academy of Motion Pictures. And they had everything. I mean, they had every biography of a movie star, every memoir written by every producer, director, you name it. Um, they also had you know, every newspaper, every fan magazine, every everything. <laughs> books on interior design, um, you know, books on the Hollywood hotels, uh, you know, book, just like really everything. And then uh, once I once I really zoned in, the, I think these poor librarians really just hated me at the beginning because I walked in and I said, I need some help. Um, I would like to learn about Hollywood. <laughs> and they and they were like, uh huh. <laughs> What, what uh, time period did you have in mind? And I said, well, you know, about 1940 through 1980. <laughs> uh, but so once I really zoned in and said, OK, I, I want to know about, um, you know, the character Irving is based on this producer named Irving Thalberg. Um, I said, OK, you know, I want to learn about Irving Thalberg in the 40s. And then they, they can pull a clipping file and give me everything, every mention of Irving Thalberg in those years. Um, and it just it made, it made my job so much easier and so much fun, because I really felt like I was collaborating with these very, very smart people um, who had all the information I needed. And they really, I mean, I, I couldn't have found it otherwise without them. So librarians are the greatest, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Yeah? So does the 
book follow Irving Stahlberg's life at all? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. Um, the so the the main character um, Elsa Emerson, who then becomes Laura Lamont, um, was very loosely. Uh, well, she was inspired by Jennifer Jones, the actress Jennifer Jones. Um, I was telling some of you in the book clubs that I got this idea while reading the obituary, uh, the obituary section. Yes, there's my friends. Um, which is true. I, I came across this obituary for Jennifer Jones, and I didn't, I wasn't, I mean, I knew her name, and I, I knew the names of some of her films, but I hadn't seen them. And um, I just thought, that is a novel, and... It's mine. It's mine. It's my novel. Um, you know, I'd written, I'd written a story collection, and I'd written um, a vast number. Well, I'd written three totally failed novels, and I was working on a fourth failing novel. Um, and my problem with the book that I was working on was that it just wasn't interesting. Like that, it was just, it was just boring. And I, I read this obituary and I thought that, like there's so much life in it and so much interest and so many different things to explore. Um, and so I sort of plotted it out, sort of loosely based on Jennifer Jones's life. But then once I was doing all this research in Los Angeles, I kept coming across all of these characters, these real people who I loved and wanted to sneak in. So I snuck in, you know, a, a person like Irving Thalberg because I just loved him to pieces. And I snuck in, you know, there's a little mention of her friend Ginger who's based on Lucille Ball because I just, I couldn't believe everything I learned about Lu Lucille Ball. You know, I mean, I, you know, when I was a kid in the 80s, like all I thought, all I knew of her was I love Lucy reruns on Nickelodeon. And um, when I was doing all this research, of course, I, I learned all this other amazing stuff about her, like that she, um, when she and Desi Arnaz were making their show, they, they bought the studio. They owned their own studio. And when they divorced, she ran it. Um, and I really wanted Laura, who sometimes has trouble with agency and with really making um, decisions that benefit her, both professionally and personally, <coughs> I really wanted her to have a really strong best friend. You know, I wanted her to have like a like a really powerful woman in her corner. That's a very circuitous answer to your question. <laughs> yes. Uh, as a summer resident of Eaton, Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to know why you chose Door County and how these peninsula players. Yeah. Um, I so I my whole family is from Wisconsin. And my parents went to Door County on their honeymoon. Twenty-nine. <laughs> um, so I, it was always a place that sort of existed in my brain, um, in some in some little way. Um, but then I went to graduate school in Madison, Wisconsin. And one year, my mom came to visit for her birthday, which is in June. And then we drove up to Door County for her birthday because one of her best friends from childhood has an art gallery there called Edgewood Orchard. It's the best. The it's the greatest. Um, and so I, I, and then by the time I was figuring this all out, you know, at Edgewood Orchard is on, this, my mother's friend's gallery is on this street called Peninsula Players Road. And I didn't go. Um, I didn't see anything more than the street sign. But I just sort of lodged it away. And then when I needed it, it was there. Um, and a few weeks ago on my book tour, I did an event at, at the gallery. And Emerson threw a big party for me at the gallery. And then I did a reading at the Peninsula Players Theater. And it was just amazing because I, you know, I, I didn't look at the website. <laughs> I didn't know what it looked like. But it turned out I did a pretty good job. Um, and so, you know, it's. It was really incredible to, I mean, we took this little trolley um, from the gallery down to the theater, and it just, it just looked exactly right. And it was very moving for me, because, I, I mean, it, it really existed just in my, in my head. And then to actually see it and to see these buildings and to think, you know, I wasn't that, wasn't that far off. But yeah, I mean, I just, I just love Door County. I think it's a gorgeous place. And 
I knew I wanted her to be from Wisconsin mm -hmm. um, because I wanted her to be a certain kind of like sturdy, good person. Um, and that's how I think of Wisconsin. And yeah, and then Door County is just the prettiest it gets. So yeah, that's why. Yeah, hello. You, you talked about uh, putting, putting a, aside the, the name of the street and remembering it. Yeah. When you did all the research, did you then put it all aside when you wrote the book? Yeah. Or did you, were you looking at it as you're writing fiction? That's a good question um, because I, you know I have a few friends who have written um, historical novels and I and I've and I've read a lot of interviews with people with other writers who had written historical novels and and the biggest the thing that kept coming up that people kept saying to me was um, that you can't you can't squeeze it all in you know you can't overload it you can't put every cool thing you learn into the book um, all that stuff is really just um, to, to sort of, it, it's sort of fuel for your imagination. Um, so I know a lot more about Hollywood, certainly, than is in this book. Now, hopefully, it's all still there. Um, but when I was writing, I, you know, I took a lot of notes at the library, and, you know, I did studio tours and all that, and I took a lot of notes. Um, and so when I was writing, you know, the first draft of specific chapters, I would refer to those notes. Um, but after that, I didn't. Uh, you know, after the first draft, I really didn't, didn't look at my notes again. Because um, I didn't want to feel beholden to reality. You know, I wanted, I knew that I knew enough to um, portray the world convincingly. And I didn't, I didn't want it to feel like, I mean, you, you know, you've read those books where, you know, it's like every, on every page, it's like the, where the author, author over explains things. Um, and I didn't want to do that. You know, I wanted there to be some room both for my imagination and for the readers. <laughs> in my standard obituary reading. Um, I have never, I was never a sporty child. Um, I was never interested in the outdoors. You know, like, I mean, once I left Westport, I grew up on the Upper West Side in Manhattan, and I, um, you know, I never really <laughs> had a whole lot of hobbies. Um, but I always loved to go to the movies. Um, and still, you know, I probably go to the movies once or twice a week. Um, and sometimes more, sometimes less, but that makes me sad. Um, I really, I really love to go to the movies, and I, I've always loved old movies as well as new ones. Um, I'm not one of those serious film buffs. You know, I have some friends who really can tell you all of the movies that were nominated for the Best Picture Academy Award in 1943, just like, from memory. But I can't do that. I can't do that at all. Um, so and I and I didn't really know that much about the studio system. You know, everything I knew about um, making movies was from Singing in the Rain. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, yes, yes. But people have brought this up several times that uh, Laura Lamont sounds an awful lot like Lena Lamont from Singing in the Rain, which I didn't I didn't intend. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I, I, I knew I wanted it to be alliterative. Um, and I have seen Singing in the Rain hundreds of times. So <laughs> like, like Peninsula Players Theater, you know, that was probably um, stored in there somewhere. Yeah. Do you see this, your book being made into a movie? Um, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would love that. Um, I have a long list of fantasy mm -hmm. casting yeah. right now. Right now, if any of you know these people, just holler at me afterwards. Um, right now, my fantasy, of course, Meryl Streep. And the Gummers, her beautiful daughters, <gasps> who are, I mean, she's got three of them, I think, and they're all blonde and look just like Meryl Streep, only, you know, they're like 30, 25, and 20 years old. It's perfect. Um, I would cast them all. <laughs> she has not returned my phone calls as yet. <laughs> but yeah.
yeah. I mean, I would love that. What I what I have heard, um, I do have a, a film agent, and what I've heard is that you know it's very hard. Um, it's very hard to film a movie like this because it covers so much time. You know, so but we'll see. I'm an I'm an optimist. Yes. Is it appropriate for young adults? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing. Speaking about Hollywood, you're not too sure. Yeah. I mean, there there are um, there's less sex and um, scandalous stuff than in most young adult novels. Okay. Really? I mean, you know, I read some YA stuff and yeah, oh, this is way less terrifying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there, there is some death, um, but you know, that happens in a lot of YA books too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the other authors that you like a lot of? What are the books that Oh, I love this. Yes. Um, I keep a list in the back of my diary. Um, I wish I had that on me right now. But uh, so the, my favorite novels of 2012, I would say, um, Where'd You Go, Bernadette, which someone was holding earlier, um, by a woman named Maria Semple. It's an epistolary book which I usually find really tedious and boring and can't stand and am not interested in, but it's so hilarious and gripping and smart that I just gobbled it up. Um, Arcadia, a book named Arcadia by a woman named Lauren Groff. Um, I just, I loved, I cried, I think for the last like 100 pages in a good way. Um, that's about a boy who grows up on like a commune that then disintegrates and he's sort of forced to be you know integrated into the real or in the into the rest of the world um, let me think what, what other books have I really loved oh I here's a here yeah hot tip this is a book that isn't out yet um, in February um, a book one of my good friends, a guy named Stuart Nadler, is publishing a book called Wise Men. That might be a really good one for you guys for first look um, because it's it, sort of like my book. It's sweeping, like it covers a lot of time, um, but it's about a family um, mostly in Cape Cod and Massachusetts. And it's just, I mean, it's really, it's about, you know, love and race and politics and heartache and it's beautiful like those are but that's 2013 so yeah I mean I, I read constantly Did you, read the chaperone? you know I haven't read the chaperone um it's funny we're published by the same publisher um and I got a copy pretty early I think I was still working on the sort of final tweaks of my book, and so I wanted I didn't I didn't want to read it because it felt like it might be a little too close. Yeah, that's why I asked. Because yeah. We read it right around the same time as yours, and it really covers you know, a long period. Right. Of time, touches a little bit upon you know Hollywood. Or yeah. Or yeah. No, I have it's it's in my to read stack, which has about two hundred books in it, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, with three novels that didn't make it. Yeah. Did you know this was going to be the one? And what <laughs> lessons did you learn from those three that oh, you get through the others? So many lessons. I mean, I, although really I would say I learned the same lesson over and over and over again, which was just that, um, that I needed to have confidence in myself and I needed to be disciplined about getting my work done and that it would happen eventually. Like I really always believed that. Even when I got a hundred rejection letters for a novel, I just thought, you know what? Okay, it, it might not be this one, but it'll happen eventually. Um, and I just, I really, I don't know what that's called, if that's stubbornness. <laughs> um, but it's, I don't, I just, I really, I really never gave up on myself. Um, I also, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't necessarily know um, that this book was going to be the one that sold. I, I had a feeling that it would just because um, my short story collection came out um, in 2011 and was published by a very, very, very small press, a one person small press. <laughs> And I just thought, you know, I've waited for so long to get a book published that I am going to treat this like 
it's going to be on the New York Times bestseller list. I am going to, you know, have a blog and a Twitter and a everything, all of those things. Um, and I sent myself on a book tour. And I, I was already working at a bookstore at that point, um, so I already knew some, some other booksellers that way, but I met a lot of other booksellers, and I, I hand-sold that book um, with such fervor <laughs> that by the time I w had, a, had a draft of, my no of this novel that was ready to go out, I knew a lot of editors at various publishing houses in New York, and I had enough um, of a friendly relationship with them that I thought, okay, they know how hard I work. Um, they know that I'm not a complete idiot. Um, you know, and they, they know that I'll, I'm really going to work on my own behalf. That, you know, because I think a lot of writers still, um, I have this conversation with my dad a lot because my father's a writer. He's written about 20 novels. If you like scary books, then you might know his name is Peter Straub. Um, but I have this conversation with my dad a lot because I, you know, I mean, I will really like hand sell every single copy of my book and I feel like it's my job to do that. And my dad is like, what are you talking about? You, you wrote the book, you handed it in, your job is done. Um, and I think it was like that in the 80s. Um, but it's not like that anymore. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would say that that's, that's really probably the thing that I learned, that like you have to really be your own best publicist and advocate and friend and not be ashamed to, you know, tell people you meet, I wrote this book. I think you'd really love it. <laughs> yeah, hi. Hi. Do you have another novel in the works now? I do. I do. It's very hard to work on it because um, I'm away so much at the moment. But yes, I have sold the next novel uh, to Riverhead for 2014. Um, and it actually, it. I think, um, that every book is sort of written in reaction to the last one. And so, you know, when I wrote Laura Lamont, I was just coming off of this story collection, and I thought, you know, I really, I don't want, I don't want something that's sort of bite-sized. I want something big um, and ambitious. And after writing this, I think, I, I thought, you know, I want something really compressed in a really, like, tight amount of time where a bunch of characters where they're all trapped in a house together. Um, so the next book is about a family on vacation, an extended family on vacation in Mallorca, Spain, over two weeks, the whole thing. Which does mean that I have to go do research there. I bet they have very nice librarians in Mallorca. <laughs> When you work at you work you own your own bookstore, you own bookseller in a store. I don't even own a tiny bit of the bookstore. <laughs> um, I'm only there part time. I was uh, going to ask when you write. Yeah. I um I have a number of jobs, and I mean, I work at the bookstore. My husband and I do some design work together. Um, I teach writing workshops in my dining room. Um, I have a lot of things cooking, um, and so for me, it's really important to be very strict with myself about my writing time. And so when it's when I have, you know, an open calendar, I actually I really put it on there, and I say, okay, I'm going to write from. Even if it's just you know nine to noon, or if I can spend the whole day writing, that's when it's really juicy and delicious, and I'm very happy. Um, but yeah, usually I can write two, two to three days a week. Um, you know, maybe two and a half, maybe two, <laughs> maybe one and a half. But usually, when I'm really um, knee deep in something, it's about two and a half days. Yeah. I was going to ask you whether it's in yourself or in other people that you've seen it, if you think there's any, you know, maybe one or two things of what makes somebody a successful writer, author? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think there are, there are so many different kinds of, so many different kinds of writer and so, much, so many different kinds of success. You know, I mean, I, um, like I said, you know, I grew up with a dad who was a writer and that was his only job and, 
his books were always on the bestseller list. Um, and so that was that, I mean, both of those things, those things by themselves, you know, just a writer who didn't have to have another job, that's success. Or a writer who sells lots of copies, that's a success. I was thinking something like, you know, do you think somebody has to have creativity or discipline or, you know, that kind of thing, like qualities they have to oh, I have see. To, 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 that you maybe see a theme of success? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... I think successful writers do need to have discipline, for sure. Um, because if you're just sitting around and you're waiting for the muse to strike, you're going to be sitting a long time. Um, you know, which is why a lot of people say, oh, you know, I have a novel in me. Um, and it says, great, you know, but it's not going to come out unless you sit down at your desk every day. Um, I think. So discipline, I think, is very important. Creativity, absolutely. But you know, I think that there are also different kinds of books that, you know, I think, um, you know, if you're writing a, you know, a history book, maybe you need, um, you know, diligence and um, focus and attention to detail and um, a, a better memory, maybe. And if you're writing fiction, maybe you need to have, a, you know, a, a big imagination and all that, but it all comes from sitting down, sitting down and sort of strapping yourself to your workspace. Yeah? Hey. You used to write nonfiction, and I'm wondering if you're happier writing nonfiction or fiction had to come about that you made the switch and you want to go back, or are you happy? In well, I write, I, I, I still write nonfiction. I, I write um, essays and things. Um, I don't know, I, I find that it comes from a different part of my brain. Um, when I was young, when I was in college, I was a poet. I always thought that I was going to be a poet when I grew up. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, poetry and fiction and nonfiction, they, they are, it's all really different parts of, of myself. So I, I feel like I can, it's actually easier for me to, you know, I can be working on like a novel and then, you know, sort of sneak away um, to write an essay. That's much easier than sneaking away to write a short story or something. Oop, I hit this, Aaron. I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of impossible for me because then you're, you're, you're sort of trying to access the same wires for two different purposes. And my brain is not that organized. Yeah? When you had your heroine dye her hair brunette, have you fantasized about doing that <laughs> <laughs> um, That is a very good question. I I did it once. It didn't suit me. It didn't suit me. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Should I? No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Blonde, blonde. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't expect that she'd know who you were because I knew she had read the book. Which, oh, I love her from Rookie. From Rookie, yeah. And uh, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, so one of my other jobs is writing for an online magazine called Rookie. It's a magazine, or it's an online magazine for teenage girls. The editor in chief is 16 years old. Wow. I know. It's a little crazy. Um, she's a junior in high school in Oak Park, Chicago, uh, Oak Park, Illinois, at, just outside Chicago. Um, and she's brilliant. Um, this young woman's name is Tavi Gevinson, and she had a style blog for a long time, since she was 12. She was giving me this blog. And um, if for some reason, I don't know how people found it, but all these fashion people started to find it, and she, um, I don't know, she started getting well known. And so just a year ago, last fall, she started this magazine called Rookie that um, there are about 40 writers, 40 staff writers like myself. Um, some of them are 16, some of them are 32. <laughs> some, you know, one of, one of the other editor, the, the woman who helps her edit is 40. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just the best. I mean, I read Sassy Magazine when I was a teenager. That was really my Bible. And Rookie is like that. Um, it's really honest and, um, God, I, I mean, you know, it, it, it teaches me all sorts of things all the time. 
So yeah, if you have teenage girls in your life, or if you feel like a teenage girl on the inside, <laughs> which I do, I highly recommend rookiemag.com. Should we do maybe one more question? I don't, I don't want to keep you here forever. Anyone we haven't heard from yet? Yeah? I follow a lot of walkers on Twitter. I follow you. Uh -huh. I, you know, I really enjoy it. It gives you kind of a different perspective. In many cases, on less the author uses it only as a promotional tool. Yeah. But I see that you, know, you seem to also follow other writers. It's a, sure. It's a community that, you know, I like seeing my writers follow other writers. You know, yeah. But you think of Twitter and then its purposes. I love it. I love Twitter. I, it's sort of embarrassing to talk about it because, um, you know, it feels sort of dweeby, but I really love it um, because, you know, most of the time I'm writing, I'm sitting in my house by myself talking to my cats. Um, you know, I usually don't wear party dresses. Um, and it gets sort of lonely. And so you can go on to this magical place on the internet where lots of friends of mine are hanging out all the time. Many of them are writers, many of them are booksellers, many of them are librarians, um, and lots and lots and lots of them just like books or like other things that I like. You know, there are people who I talk to because uh, I don't, or people who I follow because they're just because they're funny or just because they talk about the movies, and I'd like to hear about the movies. Um, uh, yeah, I just, I love it. I think it's a really wonderful place to go where you can always feel like you're a part of a conversation and there's always interesting stuff. Um, and then, you know, you can also take a picture of your party dress and you can put it up and you say, what do you think of my party dress? And then people respond and they say, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming.